Let's talk about the greatest clock ever made and see how it works. Growing up, our local airport was Spokane International. International because it's a mere 150 kilometers to the Canada border. Fairly unremarkable, but set into the wall of the main concourse was a fantabulous map. Not only did it show the whole world, it showed which parts were currently day and which were night. And this changed every time I came back to see it. This wasn't a computer display, mind you. This is the Reagan administration we're talking about. It was analog. A real physical map that changed. And I was obsessed with it. The Geochron World Clock was introduced in 1964, and it shows just about every bit of time and calendar information possible. Everything for everywhere on Earth all at once. The map slowly moves over the course of the day, showing what is day and what is night. The Terminator lines move even more slowly over the course of the year, going from solstice to equinox to solstice to equinox. You can even see the point on the Earth the Sun is currently above, and watch that trace out an analemma over the year. These used to be serious executive prestige items, because one, they're incredibly cool, but also two, they were incredibly expensive. An article from 1965 quotes the price as being $465, or about $4,500 in 2024 dollars. They're still being made, and they're a bit cheaper now, but not by much. I never stopped wanting one, but it was always something to do after winning the lottery or something. Occasionally I would look at used ones on eBay, but those were still pretty expensive, plus significant shipping costs that quickly put them up in the range of a machine tool. And we all know what takes priority there. Then, sometime last year, I realized I'd never really looked at local sources, like Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. I'm not sure why. Geochrons just always seemed like impossibly glamorous objects that would have to come from far away, I guess. Anyway, last December I found a 1985 model in Portland for $300. It didn't even have the hideous fake wood grain which almost all the used listings have. It had a burned out bulb, but I knew I'd want to upgrade those to LEDs anyway. The date advance knob was very hard to turn, but the Terminator bars did move. Everything else seemed okay, but there's only so much testing you can do on an object that runs at one revolution per year. I just had to hope I could fix anything else wrong with it. Helpfully, it came with the original manual, which included a full set of diagrams, and also glorious paragraphs like this. If the international dateline coincides with the mean sun, mean noon, half of the Earth's surface is today, and the other half is tomorrow, or yesterday, depending on which half one's position is. Thus, there are two different weekdays and dates at any given moment, except for an instant each day when it is midnight at the dateline. At this point of time, the same day exists around the Earth. I really am delighted how, despite studying time and calendar systems quite a bit over the years, the instant I start to dig into any of the details they sound completely and utterly deranged. I am a time cube traveler, and I am educated stupid. There wasn't anything wrong with the map it came with, but I had already decided I would buy a new replacement anyway. As cool as having one with the USSR on it would be, The new ones are just much better, graphically speaking, with details of the ocean floor and whatnot. It's kind of amazing how rapidly our understanding of the Earth can change. Just 40 years ago, a high-end luxury map might completely ignore over two-thirds of the surface of the planet. Replacing the map meant taking the device apart. And it all looked to be in pretty good shape, except for the shadow filters, these blue lighting gels. They're what darkened the light shining through on the nighttime parts, and decades of heat from the old fluorescent tubes had left them darkened, warped, and brittle. So those would have to be replaced as well. Luckily, Geochron is shockingly open to people doing their own restorations. After some very helpful emails back and forth, I sent them the lighting modules for the LED upgrade that they offer, and also ordered replacements for the shadow filters and new bands for the calendar and map. Thanks, Joanna. While waiting for those, I started to dig into the mechanism. The main source of the stiffness was easily found. This is the drive sprocket for the calendar band. This spring-loaded idler, which holds the band against the sprocket, wasn't rotating smoothly. The lubricant inside had gone very gummy, so it was rotating with the sprocket, pinching the calendar band. Easy fix. With the map band off, I could get a better look at it. 
There are three copies in a row, because it has to wrap around the device with enough room in the middle for the mechanisms. Oddly enough, the join is along the international dateline. I guess that was done to hide it better, but wow. No surprise that they stopped doing that, given how convoluted the dateline has become since then. I was also curious to see how well I could date the map by the features on it. So we turn now to one of the more reputable sources of information left to us today, XKCD. Istanbul or Constantinople? Istanbul. Does the Soviet Union exist? Emphatically. Is most of West Africa a giant French blob? Thankfully not. How many Vietnams are there? One. Jimmy Carter is... Fine, I guess, though I'm afraid this flowchart will soon need an update. The Sinai is part of what country? Hmm, this map just leaves it as disputed. But we're starting to get some actual dates. Let's say Egypt for now. What's the capital of Micronesia? Unfortunately, this map doesn't mark capitals differently from other cities. Nor does it show any cities at all in Micronesia. If I say Colonia, Republic of the Upper Volta or Burkina Faso? Burkina Faso, giving us 1985 through 1988. Or if I say Palakur, number of Yemens plus number of Germanys. Two Yemens plus two Germanys equals four, giving us 1989 through early 1990. So the best we can say, based on the flowchart, is sometime between 1985 and 1990. And the real answer, according to the copyright on the map? 1987. So Colonial was still the capital of Micronesia, and they were just being very conservative about the Sinai. After all, as it says at the bottom of the fine print, with the map removed, I could also see the day of the week band. It advances at the same rate as the map band, but it has to be much longer. The map band is three days long, but this is seven to cover a full week. Being two and a third times longer, it has to double back on itself several times around these rollers in order to fit in the same space. Then it was time to replace the shadow filters, which meant a partial disassembly of the main mechanism. These metal strips, called the reeds, are the heart of it. As they rotate back and forth on this pivot, this acrylic bar also rotates coaxially with them, but at a different rate. This pulls their tips, forcing them to bend into a nice sinusoidal arc, the exact geometry of which comes from its shape and thickness. On the back side, you can see these two arms turning the two concentric shafts back and forth at these different rates to achieve the effect. You can also see how the entire central mechanism shifts left and right over the course of the year. This is because apparent solar time and mean solar time don't always agree with each other, according to the equation of time. Sorry, no, I didn't say that right. The equation of time. Basically, if we record where the sun is in the sky at noon every day for a year, not only will it move up and down with the seasons, it also moves left and right a bit, forming a kind of figure eight pattern. This is due to the eccentricity and obliquity of the Earth's orbit. It's a bit hard to see, but this is the equation, equation of time, time cam, cam, which encodes the equation into its shape and pushes this whole rack back and forth as it rotates over the course of a year. If you follow the clock of the long now work, you might have seen this picture of their equation, equation of time cam, cam, which is more three-dimensional because it needs to account for the predicted changes in the Earth's orbit over the next 10,000 years. But don't worry, mine shouldn't have any serious discrepancies for at least another couple centuries. And here it is running as seen from the front. This black pointer is the sun marker, and here you can see it moving up and down to create the vertical component of the analemma. I'm running it off a drill in these clips. It might seem like it's all moving at a fairly stately pace, but remember, this is supposed to happen over the course of a year. I'm literally running it over a million times faster than its normal operation here. It's very weird working with a device that operates on timescales like that. There is a chance I put more cycles on it while testing, then it'll go through in normal operation for the rest of my life. It really was like working on my own little clock of the long now. Once I was convinced the mechanism was working again, and I remembered to synchronize the calendar band with the position of the terminator reads, I could slide on the new map and start to button it all back up. 
This meant gluing the glass cover to the calendar display back on, as the old glue had failed, and carefully cleaning the inside of the main window. And then it was good as new again. Doing the work myself was a lot of fun, but honestly paying for the replacement parts piecemeal like this meant I ended up spending almost as much as if I had just paid for their refurbishing service. I don't regret my choice, because I got hands-on experience with a Geochron, and frankly that's an honor. What an amazing mechanism. But if you want one and aren't sure if you have the skills, don't worry that you could be saving loads of money doing it yourself. So here's how you use it. In the upper right, you have the minute display. Under that, the main map. This shows day and night, obviously, but also the position of the sun with this dot. To determine the time for a place, find which time zone it is in, designated by a letter. Then look at the top of the map for that letter, which will be pointing at its current time on this strip. Daylight savings at the top, standard at the bottom. Day of the week is shown in this insert on the map, for both sides of the international dateline. Then under the map is the calendar date display, again with pointers for each side of the international dateline. With the update and restoration process done, it was time to mount it on the wall. Well, first it was time to drive across the continent and back, mostly to meet this little guy and to do some research at the Smithsonian, but there was plenty else to see and do along the way. But then it was time to mount it. The question was, how? It's designed to be set into a wall, hence the flange around the top, and the general lack of finish behind it. Special hinged brackets let it pivot out so you can access the adjustment knobs. I didn't think I could talk my housemates into letting me start cutting out wall studs, though. So what about a box into which it mounted, which in turn was then mounted to the wall? I gave this a lot of thought, but it was going to be difficult to make it all fit under the flanges, and matching the dark brown color was just going to be annoying. Instead, I started to look at these auxiliary hooks. What if I just made a bracket it could hang from and bolted that to the wall? I thought the flanges might look a little bit weird this way, but when we tried holding it up to the wall, it looked fine. The sides are entirely lost in shadow. The only concern was the bottom side with all its gaping holes. These let out a lot of light, which would surely light up the wall under it and look terrible at night. So I got some quarter-inch aluminum plate and set to work making a new continuous plate that could mount on the bottom and block all the light. The drawings that came with the device were great, but sadly they didn't include information like the exact spacing of the screw holes. So how to make a plate that would mount to them without any dimensions? I couldn't even use old transfer punch techniques because there was no way to get the punch and hammer into position. About the best I could do was reach a little C-clamp around, so I turned that into a kind of reverse transfer punch. I drilled and tapped a hole through its static anvil, then turned a point onto the end of a screw. By threading that up through the hole in the anvil, I could adjust it up and down until the pointed end was at any height I wanted. With a scrap piece of soft aluminum clamped against the frame, I was able to use this... C-punch? Transfer pole? I don't know, thing to transfer the position of the holes one by one, simply by guiding the pointed screw end into each hole, then clamping it tight to leave a mark in the scrap piece. And it worked pretty well. After that, I needed to mill the plate to size, leaving holes for the two adjustment rods to poke through. And of course, that meant slotting the hole for the date adjustment shaft, as it moves back and forth along with the map over the course of the years, part of the analemma movement. Progress was stopped for a couple days when the mill mysteriously ground to a complete halt after changing into low gear. Whoa, what is going on? After entirely removing the motor and CVT housing, I finally tracked this down to the drum brake pivot screw. It had worked loose, started to hit the bottom of the pulley cone. Then when I switched into low gear and ran the motor backwards, that made it unscrew itself until it was locked solid. Quite a bit of effort to replace a single screw, to be sure. But at least the fix itself was trivial, and everything went back together again properly. The wall bracket was just a slotted piece of steel that could slip over the hooks, welded to a simple T-frame with some extra bracing just to be sure. Of course, if it can slip on easily, it can slip off easily too. Either due to someone bumping into it accidentally, or vibrating off due to footsteps over time, or rattling off violently during an earthquake. So I added some little socket cap screws at the far ends of each slot, which could be added once it was in place. A coat of primer, just so it isn't rusting nastily while hidden behind the geocron, and it was done. 
Installation was a simple matter of screwing the bracket into the wall stud, which happily was nicely centered between the bookcases. I also wired in a replacement power switch for the lights, since the original couldn't be removed from its mounting plate and I wanted something a bit sleeker anyway. A couple days later, I needed to address the power cord hanging down. The correct solution was to add a recessed outlet behind the Geochron, so I first did this for the AC wall clock in my shop, just to make sure I could do it without making a total hash of it. So AC clocks. They're kind of obsolete, but they're really pretty neat. They've got no escapement of any kind. Instead, they rely on the frequency of the electrical mains they're hooked up to. This drives a synchronous motor, which rotates at some fixed multiple of mains frequency, 60 hertz in this part of the world, to directly drive the clock movement. This makes them cheap, at least in comparison to mechanical clocks, because they have so much less precision, expensive clockwork inside. They're also very accurate in comparison, because the frequency of mains power is usually quite reliable, at least when averaged over a day or so. Occasionally it does drift though, either for technical or political reasons. And one of the more obvious symptoms when that happens is that clocks in the area start to drift as well. Not so much now, with cheap quartz movements that can run for years off a single battery and connected devices pulling time updates for themselves over the network, but it's still a real issue. I got one for the shop mostly just to honor this bit of horological history. And as always, it's been interesting getting up close and personal to a faded technology. That said, yeah, modern clocks really are just better. These either need a special recessed outlet behind them, or else you have an ugly cord hanging down. They do keep great time, except for when there's a power outage. And that happens a lot more frequently than the battery in a quartz clock running out. And while the motor doesn't draw much power, it still puts out enough heat to generate currents of air running up behind the clock, as shown by these dust streaks. Anyway, since there already happened to be an outlet on that stud, this wasn't too hard. Just cutting a hole on the drywall, adding a wall box, running some Romex down to the existing box, and splicing it in. Getting the Romex into the lower outlet was a bit of a challenge since both of its knockouts were already in use. But it was worth it. Look how much better that is without the cord dangling down. This room, originally just a humble dining room, has transcended its origins and has earned a new name. This is now the boardroom. Having had it in my life for a while now, I've really enjoyed being able to go over with my coffee in the morning and just ponder it. Looking at maps is never wasted time, and these are some pretty great maps. I like the greater awareness I have of the course of the seasons and the stately procession of our planet around its orbit. It definitely makes me think a lot more about time zones and how convoluted and arbitrary they are. Look at what we've done to the dateline. Did you know that days on Earth now last 26 hours from start to finish? And see this little bit of Australia? That's a time zone used by a couple tiny towns along a very isolated section of highway, but it's not officially recognized by the Australian government. Asking how many time zones there are is almost as complicated as asking how many countries there are. Forget complaining about daylight savings. Though yeah, screw that idea. Let me end this video with a very serious and practical and modest proposal to do away with time zones entirely. I don't think we need them anymore. Time zones came about because the technology of steam transportation meant we were suddenly moving around very quickly. Quickly enough, anyway, to worry about what it meant for something over the horizon to be happening at the same time as something here. We were forced to divide the concept of now into discrete chunks in order to reason about it clearly and safely. Since then, we've realized that the idea of simultaneity is even weirder than that, while at the same time, Technical advances have made time zones something that most of us have to deal with on a regular basis, as global, real-time communication has just become part of daily life. And just as technical advances originally made time zones essential, I think more recent ones have made them obsolete as AC clocks. We all now carry devices that keep perfect time, have immense computational resources, and know where they are on the surface of the Earth to within a meter or so. That makes time zones redundant. It's the hunt for the longitude all over again, but backwards. Knowing the time in UTC plus longitude gives you your local solar time. And if every timestamp was in UTC and had a longitude associated with it, it could be converted as needed into local solar time for any other place on the planet trivially. If you prefer, you can think of this not as getting rid of time zones, but of adding some instead. 
Quite a few, actually. We'd go from the 38 or so currently in use to 86,400, each 15 arc seconds wide or about 30 meters at the equator. You'd cross dozens in an average commute, and your devices would effortlessly be adjusting the display of their clocks up or down one second for each one. Noon would be an observable objective fact again, when the sun is highest in the sky. Sundials could be moved east and west without adjustment, and it would be a great excuse to get more displays like the Geochron into our lives. Look, I started this section of the video as a joke, but after writing it all out, I'm actually about 90% convinced this is a good idea. At the very least, you cannot convince me this is any more complicated than what we're already doing. Whew. This one was a bit of a beast, so congrats on sticking it out if you're still watching. A reminder that I'll be at OpenSauce June 15th through 16th in San Francisco, so stop by and say hi if you're going to be there. I'm not sure I'll have the video out beforehand, but I'll be bringing a new device of mine which solves the age-old problem of dice not being complicated enough that you won't want to miss. Anyway, cheers, and maybe I'll see you at the Cow Palace.